is special because it's the 25th anniversary of our teacher, Doji Chang Kalar and Pache's uh, Power Nirvana. Kalar and Pache passed away 25 years ago, so all of the Kalar and Pache centers uh, throughout the world are doing a celebration. Kagi Tupton Trolling Monastery and Retreat Center in Wampingers Falls, New York. Kala Rinpoche was a very special, unique person who had very strong devotion and his mind was completely absorbed in the Buddha's teachings and he loved meditation. He had like an extraordinary amount of compassion for sentient beings. Kala Rinpoche really was not human. He never saw him upset once in all their time together. And it just every time he met him, he just seemed better than before in terms of being more peaceful, more joyful, content, very affectionate, very, very loving to all the beings he met. Today we all met to remember his kindness, remember his life story, remember his example. He's an example of someone who, in a single lifetime, was able to meditate and attain complete enlightenment. And then that inspires us each to meditate a little more and practice Dharma. He was basically able to uh, completely read the minds of the beings that he was talking to and answer that in the most beneficial way so that they were able to literally be famous. He emanated something that was so special. Um, when you were with Kala Rinpoche, it was as if you were suddenly transported into another universe. There were all these mirrors. We sat down and the room was just completely a bunch of mirrors. And they were, I remember the room as being almost, I don't know if it was round or what, but we all started to notice if we looked in a mirror, we saw five of ourselves. And so then Kala Rinpoche um, said something to Lama Norla Rinpoche, which he translated. He said, this is what it's like when you're in Dewa Chen. You will be able to emanate many of yourselves, and it'll be just like this. <laughs> so I just thought that was very profound that he's he used every opportunity to show us that, you know, the Dharma isn't some far off thing from us, it's right with us, that we don't see things like that. Her first heard about Kala Rinpoche when he was very young in Tibet. People talked about him. He lived far away, but he was very famous because he was such a realized lama. And Rinpoche had devotion for him even then, before he met him, and he was just wondering what day would he be able to meet him. He was finally able to meet him when he was 26 years old, and he was in Varanasi, India, when he found him. Later, when Kala Rinpoche reflected on their first meeting, he told Lama Norla Rinpoche, that first time we met, it was just like a mother meeting her child again. I have dedicated my life to him. Lama Norla Rinpoche has not only mastered nirvana, <coughs> but also samsara. And he is the most capable and able Lama. And he has no self-interest whatsoever. So whatever you're going to need, you're going to get from him. He's going to be not only your teacher and your Lama, but he will be your brother, your sister, your servant, your mother, your father. He will do all that for you. And that's why you should, when you practice the Dharma, you should rely on him. So having been here now, having known Rinpoche for over 30 years, um, 
I can say that is definitely the truth. This expression, love and kindness, compassion, I never knew what that meant, really, love and kindness, but his face, this his expression and his face, was a presence I simply never experienced before, his expression of just love and kindness. I never saw one day his upset and... Mm -hmm. Of Cholera Pache's attendance, you know, sort of rustling all of us up. It was just taking time for everybody to just get their stuff together and, and get organized. And the attendant was like, you know, he's 81 years old and he's been waiting for you all in the shrine room for an hour. And so in my mind, um, you know, someone who's waiting that long, I mean, I knew he was a great llama and everything, but someone who's waiting for someone for an hour is going to be, if not testy, they're going to be kind of somewhat disturbed uh, that we were late and so I had in my mind that we had to hurry and get upstairs and so when we walked in the room I was just like looking to see like wh what he was going to do and he was just sitting there like shining like the sun and um, it taught me something about what patience <coughs> really is that patience is not like restraining yourself and kind of forbearance and trying to tolerate a difficult situation but real patience is just you know, resting in the natural condition of the mind. Jay had that ability and that power to awaken people's minds with the Dharma. That's all you had to do is hear him. And he could awaken the Dharma in us. I had a dream of Kalaram Jay in uh, the basement of our house. We have a very old um, farmhouse, I guess like 19th century. It has a very old basement. And in the basement, there's a, a room that's walled up. It's very small. It's like closet size. Um, and I dreamt that Colin Bache was there, but the room was open, and it wasn't a closet. It was like very large. And so I sort of took that to mean that, um, like, you might think that you know your house, but there are actually <laughs> rooms that you don't, you aren't aware of. <laughs> and so you might think that you know your mind, and there's always like another door that can open. Rinpoche would sit on the throne in the morning and wouldn't get up until he was told to leave for lunch and he would drink tea, everybody else was coming and going in and out and he never budged. <laughs> and, and all of us were turning red, uh, the sun was so hot and Kala Rinpoche would just simply sit there, he never got up and went to the bathroom, he never left, they didn't have any shade for him, they had no umbrella over him or anything. And he did this for days. And he then at the end of the day, he would get done and he would go. And, and I, I said to Lama Norla Rinpoche, I said, well, how is it possible he could do this? And Rinpoche said, it's because he had complete control over his physical being. <laughs> Basically in Buddhism, the idea is that all of us possess a fully awakened, enlightened nature, but we're temporarily obscured from it due to mental afflictions and distraction and such, and that it is possible through meditation to remove obscurations and become in touch with our true nature, and that's what is called enlightenment. So there are lamas, such as Kala Rinpoche, great meditation masters who have attained this enlightenment. That means that they have meditated, removed 
the temporary obscurations and realize their own true nature. So when such a being dies, when their physical body dies, then it is said that their mind passes into paranirvana. So they have an awakened mind that is not, it is not obscured in the same way ordinary beings' minds are obscured. So when they die, their mind remains in a state of enlightenment, and we refer to that as paranirvana. Paranirvana is when a great being, when a Buddha passes from this life into, well, I can't say into his next life because he's enlightened, or she's enlightened, and so it's beyond birth and death, but it's a time that they leave the human form from this world that we're accustomed to. I would say it's unique among most beings in the world. It's not, it's not so unique among Tibetan Buddhist lamas. I mean, there was a great tradition. I mean, that, that's what's so wonderful about Tibet, as the Dalai Lama said, that they are the custodians of the full range of the Buddha's teachings. And not just like in an intellectual way, not just that they have books in a library, but that they have deeply internalized the meaning of the Buddha's teachings through meditation practice. So in Tibet, there were, there were many uh, you know, compared to maybe in other parts of the world, there are many people who did attain enlightenment, who followed the teachings and attained enlightenment. That's kind of what's unique about Buddhism. It's not so much as having faith in some, some, some other awakened being that's outside of you. It's that every person who puts the teachings into practice, who does the meditation, that every person can attain the same state of enlightenment. It's possible. It just is a matter of dedication and diligence and meditation. So, um, yes, it is unique. Now, not everyone does attain full awakening, but it's not unheard of. In a sense, um, he is present here all the time uh, because he is in the uh, pure enlightened realm which is all around us, uh, which we are, uh, in, in a sense, uh, one of the very important goals of Buddhism is to realize that uh, and to make, uh, to clear away all of our uh, uh, mundane perceptions, confusions, mental, uh, um, <clears throat> emotional stuff uh, that gets in the way of our contacting this. So he is present. And of course, he's also present uh, through Lama Norla Rinpoche, who was his student, and received uh, teachings, empowerments, and in effect, the whole package of the of two lineages, the Karmakagyu lineage and the Shangpa lineage, both of which were held by Kala Rinpoche, which means to hold a lineage means that one actually has in one's mind all, all of the teachings and practices of that lineage, uh, not just in books, but in one's mind as a, as a, a part of a living present. I would say if I was going to boil down Kala Rinpoche's teachings, there would be two essential points. One is compassion for others, and the other is looking at the uncontrived nature of your own mind. And, and that those two things actually go together, that the more compassion that we have for others, the easier it is to see our own pure nature. And the more we see our own pure nature, the more we give rise to uncontrived compassion for others. Those two really reinforce each other. We are suffering a lot of the time. That uh, we're, we want to do good things, we want to have happy lives, we want to have satisfying relationships and jobs and, and uh, projects and so on. <clears throat> and sometimes we succeed to a point, but then all this other negative stuff comes in and, uh, and we're disappointed uh, or uh, we are afraid. The Buddhism uh, uh, talks a lot about 
the two major fears uh, for human beings, which is one, the fear of losing what we have and the fear of not getting what we want. And so people are walking around, you know, or living their lives um, with all of these kinds of things sort of running around them inside or sometimes they're more aware than others, <clears throat> excuse me, um, but they're always there. So we attain uh, some success, you know, uh, we graduate from, uh, from school, uh, we win a game, uh, we get an award, and we're very happy and elated, and then it's gone. And then we're sad again, and we're sort of back on the treadmill. Well, what can I do next? So uh, Buddhism is about giving people a path, a whole set of teachings, practices, uh, uh, systems to get off that kind of treadmill of success, disappointment, success, disappointment, frustration, uh, hopes, hopes dashed, and so on. The, the most important teachings that he received he from Kala Rinpoche have to do with the Mahamudra nature of the mind, Mahamudra, Dzogchen, the great perfection. Every one of us, every living being, not just human beings, but all the other beings in their, living beings in their various forms, all of us have within us the seed of enlightenment. Every living being has, uh, has within him, it, herself, the Buddha nature, that is the seed. It's already there. Uh, and the essential task is to clear away all of our uh, mundane perceptions of reality, all of our mental habits, all of our, our, our social mores and things that get in the way of realizing that. And the, uh, one of the most essential qualities of it is compassion for all other living beings, complete compassion. That is the understanding and it's beyond our usual notion of empathy. Um, which is just something, oh yeah, I feel what you're feeling. Uh, but for an enlightened being, enlightened being is able to sense everything that every one of us is feeling uh, and to see into the depths. Any sentient being who saw who just said mantras of compassion for them, Kala Rinpoche had two concerns, was either the Buddhist teachings or the welfare of sentient beings. That was really all he thought about. I never heard him criticize anyone. Yeah. Meditation is the key because it's developing awareness. We ordinarily are not aware of the ways in which our mind is really working. We're sort of inside it all the time. Uh, and we're aware of the effects of the way it works, but we are not aware of, of how in reality it is really working. Meditation uh, gives us the opportunity to find ways to get outside of that framework, in a sense and see more and more clearly. And it's, it's progressive, of course. That's why there are stages of meditation and practice. Um, the chanting is uh, another way because it's, uh, there are a lot of different kinds of chanting, uh, but in a sense, it's a way of doing it together with other people, which is very helpful. And also, uh, just the act of saying these particular words uh, that are, in effect, the words and teachings of the Buddha, it's like, uh, <clears throat> you know, you start by just saying the words. And gradually, as you keep doing this uh, over, over, over time, uh, you, if you're 
aware, you're building awareness and you're studying and thinking, contemplate, we call this contemplating and studying, thinking about what these words actually mean in terms of your own situation and uh, the situation of all living beings, the meaning starts to, you start to uncover the meanings more and more deeply. Uh, so just chanting at one time uh, has some benefit, but it's not going to be really effective in clearing away all of the, the mental, emotional underbrush that's covering over uh, our Buddha nature. One of the teachings that he gave us before we went into retreat is he acknowledged that you know, we were all Westerners who, who were pretty unfamiliar with the profound methods of the Vajrayana, and to many of us it just seemed quite complex and, and esoteric, although we had you know, faith and enough to be doing a three-year retreat. Still, I, he knew that it was, it was hard for us and challenging. And I remember that he just said, if you can just do it, if you could just, like, just try to do the methods, just, just, just practice the methods, they read, the methods are powerful in themselves. Like, even if you 100% don't understand every, you know, every, all the symbolism or every nook and cranny of the explanation, if you act, actually just put these methods into practice, it will really, you'll get the results. If you could just imagine, for example, if you just imagine may I attain enlightenment for the benefit of sentient beings. And if you just imagine that day after day after day, it really will have a result. And somehow the way he said that made such a, an impact on me that it, you know, it's not as complicated as it seems. And if you just put the instructions that you're given into practice, you really do get the results. And I thought it was very kind of him to kind of assure us that way before he went in. Buddha's chant, because it has proven over 2,600 years to be a really, really effective method of achieving enlightenment, of uh, understanding the way things really are, the way mind is, and uh, that is the key to uh, ending suffering and achieving happiness. Kala Rinpoche put us into three-year, three-month retreat in the fall of 1986. So he actually passed into Pari Nirvana while we were in retreat. So um, I remember the day that Lama Norla came into the retreat and gathered us all together and told us that Kala Rinpoche had passed into Pari Nirvana. And at first, I was, I was a little weepy. I, I wasn't sure quite how to feel about it. Um, because during retreat, it just always felt like he was with me all the time. And I, hadn't, I didn't sense that that had changed. 
so, but I was, I was a little weepy at first, and then, um, then I, it, it seemed to change, and a, a kind of, I hate to call it contentment or joy or happiness, but something came to the, to all of our minds, I believe, I, I'm not sure, you'd have to ask everyone else, but came to mind that that something extraordinary had happened and that the the blessing of us being in a retreat where he had put us in retreat a couple of years before the blessing of that had had uh, connected with his enlightened mind in such a way that even his pari nirvana had not changed that so it was very interesting time and i think it also was very um really brought it home to us because Tai Si Tu Rinpoche sent a, a recorded statement with Lama Norla to us and it wasn't just for us, it was for all disciples, but we got to listen to it in retreat. And he said something very interesting. He said, he said, now this is no longer just practice. This is the real thing. Now you do this. And it really brought it home to me that that is the way practice has to be every day. It's not just practice. It's the real thing all the time. And that just, I think that really got all of us right back into our meditation and right back into where we needed to be in order to, to get through that period of time. Last time I got to see Kalva Rinpoche was in California. And we were actually, um, it was December of 88, and we were, I got to be there for three weeks, and we were in a, a room with him, an interview with the group, Robert, you were there, and um, Lama Norla Rinpoche at the time had problems, uh, and Kala Rinpoche, you know, physical problems, and Kala Rinpoche said that he wanted Lama Norla Rinpoche to visit him in India, and we were all concerned because Lama Norla Rinpoche, you know, was uh, having difficult with his own health, difficulties with his own health, and Kala Rinpoche said, you know, not to worry that he really needed Lamanola Rinpoche to go to India and that he promised that if he went, nothing would happen to Lamanola Rinpoche, his health would be okay. And then he said, because this was the last time we were going to see him, he passed away the following May, and he said, you know, I promise you, if you want to be enlightened, then follow Lamanola Rinpoche, that there's no difference between myself and Lamanola Rinpoche. And that's when I understood that Lama Norla Rinpoche is, you know, when Kala Rinpoche passed, that Lama Norla Rinpoche was my living connection. You know, that Lama Norla Rinpoche, Kala Rinpoche, Dorji Chan, inseparable. This was a very special ceremony uh, using uh, prayers devoted to Kala Rinpoche and actually started with the, the prayer that he wrote, which is... Um, in Tibetan, it's called a namtar. It's a namtars are like uh, biographies of great enlightened beings, um, and they're also like homages to those beings. And this particular namtar was actually written by uh, Kala Rinpoche before he passed away, um, at the pleading of his many of his students who wanted, uh, wanted something like this uh, to be able to chant uh, after he was gone in homage to him. So uh, that's, a, that's like a complete, a very, very unique practice. We started out by reciting a prayer that outlines the major events in Kala Rinpoche's life so that is to recollect his example of someone who started at the very beginning of the path and the path of meditation and Buddhist study and traveled it to its completion and perfect enlightenment. So first we recited that together to remember his life example. And then we chanted what's called a guru yoga. So that's actually a Sanskrit, um, but the meaning is it's a meditation practice that involves visualization and also reciting a mantra and making prayers and it's based on devotion to the Lama. So based on our devotion to the Lama then we make 
certain prayers of uh, aspiring to remove our confusion and obscurations, aspiring to develop compassion for others, aspiring to realize the true nature of mind. So that was the guru yoga. There was a little bit of meditation in the middle of that when we were reciting a mantra, which is kind of a devotional mantra to the Lama. We did that. And then after the guru yoga, we did something called a sacred feast, which is a special practice in Vajrayana Buddhism, which involves creating kind of a sacred world. I was speaking about, about generating pure perception that rather than just thinking everything is just ordinary and everybody's kind of like their flesh and blood bodies and that every, everyone is sort of separate from each other and different and so forth. And one then thinks that the environment is completely pure and that all the beings are deities so that everyone is does not have like a decaying nature like we do in our regular physical bodies. Um, so thinking that all the beings are pure and that the, the, the food substances that are used as feast offerings, that those also are pure, pure meaning that we don't have attachment to them. We don't think good and bad about them. They are just sort of non-conceptually present. And so just trying to cultivate that general perception, that pure perception, perception, which is also referred to as sacred outlook. That's how we then engage in the sacred feast. So we did that, and that was that sacred feast was written by Kala Rinpoche, as was the Guru Yoga. So we were um, then reciting practices that he composed. And then we concluded with another prayer that he composed, which is a prayer of aspiration. And he was known for making amazing aspiration prayers and also teaching about the power of aspiration. So in that prayer, there's all kinds of things of aspiring to be able to, you know, practice patience for eons for the sake of a single sentient being, aspirations to always be in the company of a fully realized Lama and to always have uh, favorable conditions for practicing Dharma. The rest of the, the practice was also uh, very specifically devoted to uh, prayers and homages and uh, um, aspirations, which is a very important part of, of the Buddhist path. Um, aspirations to, in, the sen in effect, live up to uh, the, the model um, that Kala Rinpoche set for people.